Hello world. So there we were, fresh from the grand finale of World War II. And what do we do? We decide the world hasn't had enough of a scare. Enter the Doomsday Clock, a gloomy little gadget that the brainest of the brainy, those atomic scientists with guilt heavier than their IQs, dreamed up to say, hey, guess what? We're all on the fast track to oblivion. It wasn't just any clock, oh no, this was the ultimate countdown to mankind's potential self-destruction, kicking off in 1947 with hands ominously pointing at seven minutes to the end of the world as we know it. But why stop at creating a symbolic timepiece of doom? Humanity, ever the overachiever in the field of self-sabotage, ramped up the existential dread with the nuclear arm race. It was like watching two schoolyard bullies, let's call them Uncle Sam and Comrade Ivan, in a who's got the bigger bomb contest. By 1953, the superpowers weren't just puffing out their chests, they were lighting up the sky with hydrogen bombs, each blast a not-so-subtle reminder that we could turn this lovely blue marble of ours into a crispy gritter at the flick of a switch. Every test, every mushroom cloud that kissed the stratosphere was a love letter to Armageddon, and the doomsday clocks keepers were there moving their hands closer to midnight with each display of thermonuclear affection. Two minutes to midnight, they announced, and you could almost hear the world's collective gulp. So there we stood on the edge of eternity, staring into the abyss, and the abyss was staring right back, probably wondering if we had lost our collective minds. Um, spoiler alert, the jury's still out on that one. Oh, the swinging 60s. An era bursting with the beats of rock and roll, the flash of a revolutionary fashion and the near miss of global annihilation hanging by a hair. Yes, quite the electric mix. This was a decade that saw humanity skate on the thin ice of nuclear catastrophe only to throw on a pair of go-go boots and dance around the possibility of worldwide doom. Let's rewind back to 1962, to a little shindig known as the Cuban Missile Crisis. Imagine the globe as a giant chessboard, with the US and the Soviet Union glaring over it, fingers twitching about the nuclear launch buttons. Cuba, caught in the middle, became the most dangerous piece on the board ready to tip the scales towards oblivion. It was the ultimate face-off, where the stakes were nothing less than the survival of the civilization itself, and as the world held its breath, expecting to plunge into the void at any moment, something remarkable happened. Reason prevailed. But the story doesn't end there, because the 60s had more to offer than just a brush with the apocalypse. After narrowly avoiding our collective end, the world decided to chill for a bit. Enter the red telephone, the era's hot, but not literally, line directly connecting the White House to the Kremlin. It was the ultimate let's sort this out before it all go kaboom gadget. Alongside this marvel of crisis management, Treaties popped up like peace flowers with names like the partial test ban treaty whispering sweet nothings of hope to a world wary of radioactive fallout. Yet beneath this veneer of safety and flower power, the nuclear arms race was silently revving its engines, ready to sprint toward the next brink. The red telephone and diplomatic handshakes gave us the illusion of stepping back from the edge, but in the back rooms and bunkers the stockpiles grew. It was a paradoxical dance of peace signs and missile silos, where every step toward harmony was matched by a leap toward potential annihilation. The 60s then were a decade of living dangerously and fabulously on the edge. We flirted with disaster, twirled around the tenter and moonwalked near the abyss, all while crafting a world that was vibrantly alive, 
teetering between breakthroughs and breakdown. It was a time when humanity learned to negotiate with its darker impulses, even as it laid the groundwork for future challenges. And as we grooved through the decade, one thing became clear. The party wasn't over. The music had merrily paused, waiting for the next track to play in the ongoing saga of our survival. Welcome to the disco era, where the beats were as hot as the Cold War was cold, and the nuclear arms race sprinted forward like a teenager late for a first date. This was a period where the global community appeared to unite in harmony as if gathering peacefully around a campfire, all while discreetly passing notes on how to make bigger, badder bombs. Let's not mince words. This 70s and 80s were like a high-stake poker game, with the US and the Soviet Union bluffing their way through peace talks. Picture Detente as that awkward family dinner where everyone pretends to get along despite knowing Uncle Sam and Cousin Ivan have dynamite under the table. Now, for the main attraction of this absurd theater, the Strategic Arms Limitation Talks, or SALT, which sounds more like a diet plan than a disarmament negotiation. These talks were meant to put a lid on the weapon stockpile, but <laughs> guess what? Behind the curtains, it was an arms bonanza. It's like going on a diet by only eating chocolate cake on a day that ends with Y. Enter the scene MIRV, or Multiple Independently Targetable Reentry Vehicles, because why drop one nuke when you can drop a bunch? And let's not forget the neutron bomb, the equivalent of saying, we'll destroy you, but keep your buildings nice and tidy. The arms race wasn't just alive and well, it wasn't steroids, flexing in the mirror and liking what it saw. So they had it, the 70s and 80s, when the world was a ticking time bomb dressed in bell bottoms and shoulder pads. While we danced to the Bee Gees and marveled at the wonders of hairspray, the superpowers were busy ensuring they could end the world at the push of a button. But hey, at least we had good music. In the twilight of the 20th century, as the disco balls of the 80s dimmed and the digital dawn of the 90s flickered on the horizon, the world found itself in an odd, quiet space, a deceptive calm before the storm. The Berlin Wall crumbled, signaling not just the fall of concrete barriers, but the supposed end of decades or long hostilities. It was a time of paradoxes, where the global exhale at the conclusion of the Cold War was quickly inhaled in apprehension of what was to come. This period nestled between the end of an arms race that had defined a generation and the dawning of new, multifaceted global challenges was marked by a collective, albeit cautious, optimism. Peace was on everyone's lips, yet it tasted metallic, tingled with the lingering fears of what had just passed and uncertainties of what was to unfold. The world's nuclear arsenal, a monstrous legacy of the Cold War, didn't disappear. It loomed in the shadows, an omnipresent spectre at the Feast of Peace. Nations, while putting away some of their more overt tools of destruction, began to navigate a new kind of warfare, one of information, economics and burgeoning technology. The digital age promised connectivity and progress, yet it also whispered of new arenas for conflict and contention. The environment, long the silent victim of industrial and military excesses, began to voice its distress more loudly and clearly, though many chose to ignore its cries. The late 80s and early 90s were a time when the world, standing at the crossroads of history, looked forward with hope, but couldn't shake off the fears of stepping into the unknown. It was a dance on the edge of a knife, a delicate balance between embracing the promise of a new millennium and the risk of falling back into old habits and fears. As leaders and citizens alike pondering the shape of the future, the echoes of old ghosts 
of nuclear threat, of ideological battles, of environmental neglect, began to mingle with the nonsense sounds of emerging threats. This was not the end of history, as some had prematurely declared, but a brief interlude, a moment to catch our breath before plunging into the complexities of a new era of dread that awaited just around the corner. Or the 90s and beyond, when the Cold War was supposedly over and we all lived happily ever after. Not. Just when we thought it was safe to go back into the geopolitical waters, new sharks appeared. First off, let's talk about the nuclear hangover. Those thousands of nukes didn't just vanish because the USSR did. They're still out there, like the world's most terrifying <laughs> lost and found collection. And now there are more players in the nuclear poker game, each bluffing with a hand that could end everything. It's like leaving your Halloween candy with your sibling and hoping they don't eat it. All trust and no guarantees. And just when we've gotten used to the idea of mutual assured destruction, Mother Nature said, hold my beer. The planet's heating up quicker than a VHS step rewinding after a blockbuster movie marathon. And this time it's not just the polar bears in trouble. We are talking wildfires, hurricanes and ice caps melting faster than your ice cream on a hot summer day. So here we are, post-1991, surfing on the edge of a climate apocalypse with the old nuclear threat still lurking in the background, like that one relative who won't live long after the party is over. The Cold War may have cooled down, but now we are in a slow cooker set to global boiling, and the chefs in charge can't agree on the recipe. And the kicker? While well, the planet's thermostat is going haywire, the world's leaders seem more interested in arguing over who left the fridge open. It's like watching a sitcom where the house is on fire but the family's too busy bickering over the remote to call 911. Welcome to the new era of dread, where the ghosts of the past meet the spectres of the future, and humanity is still trying to figure out whether to laugh, cry, or start building an ark. Buckle up, folks, it's going to be a bumpy ride. As the calendar flipped to the 2010s, the world found itself navigating through the deceptive calm after the storm. The optimism of the early post-Cold War years had gradually given way to a creeping realization. The planet was not simply healing from its past scars, but was in fact accumulating new ones at an alarming pace. This decade, sandwiched between the lingering shadows of old fears and the looming specters of future crises, became a testament to the humanity's resilience and its enduring recklessness. Climate change, once a distant thunder, roared closer with each passing year, manifesting in devastating hurricanes, wildfires and floods that seemed to scoff at our attempts at mitigation and adaptation. The environment, along pleading for mercy, began exacting its toll, reminding us of our vulnerabilities and interdependencies. Yet, as seas warmed and ice caps melted, the world's response oscillated between fervent activism and apathetic denial, a dictomy that underscored the fractured state of global unity. The 2010s also witnessed the digital domain maturing into an arena of unparalleled influence and insidious conflict. Cyber warfare and misinformation campaigns blurred the lines between truth and falsehood. State and non-state actors creating a battleground as consequential as any physical territory. The very tools that promised to connect and uplift humanity were weaponized to sow division, exploit vulnerabilities and challenge the integrity of democracies. Meanwhile, the spectre of nuclear proliferation, rather than receding into the annals of history, found fresh ground in the ambitions of rogue states and the strategic calculations of established powers. The old logic of deterrence and mutually assured destruction, once thought to be relics of a bygone era, resurfaced into the rhetoric and posturing of leaders unbound by the lessons of the past. 
as these threats converge, the doomsday clock inched ever closer to midnight, its movement reflecting not just the probability of catastrophe, but the palpable sense of urgency for collective action. The 2010s ended with humanity standing at the precipice, peering into the 2020s with a mix of hope, fear and the dawning recognition that the time to change course was not just running out, it might be already gone. So here we are in the roaring 2020s, but instead of flappers and jazz, we've got wildfires and face masks. If you thought we had learned our lesson, think again. Humanity is like that one friend who says they're going to change, then keeps making the same mistakes, expecting different results. Welcome to the era of, oh no, not this again. Climate change is not just knocking on our door, it's a barge in, taking a seat on the couch and is refusing to leave. The ice caps are melting faster than a popsicle in the Sahara, and our weather has gone haywire. One day you're building a snowman, the next you are wondering if your house will float. And just when you think it can't get any crazier, enter stage left, a global pandemic, because why not throw a little health crisis into the mix? But wait, there's more. Just when you thought the Cold War was a relic of the past, like shoulder pads and mullets, all tensions start flaring up again. It's like history's mixtape got stuck on repeat. The new players are entering the nuclear club and the OGs are dusting off their arsenals, just in case. It's as if everyone decided that what the world really needs right now is more ways to self-destruct. And the doomsday clock? Oh, it's ticking louder than ever, practically screaming at us that it's almost midnight. We are dancing on the edge of disaster, doing the tango with catastrophe. The clock's hands are moving closer to their hour of reckoning, and it seems like we are all just spectators at the world's most dangerous countdown party. So what is the moral of this story? If the 2020s have taught us anything, it's that assuming things can't get worse is a surefire way to be proven wrong. The planet is heating up, politics are as stable as a house of cards in a wind tunnel, and the threat of going kaboom is still very much alive. In this dance with destiny, it's not just about stepping lightly, it's about changing the music entirely. Because if we keep moving to the same old beat, we might just find ourselves with no floor to dance on. Let's hope we figure out the steps before the clock strikes midnight, shall we? In the eerie quiet of impending doom, you stand alone, the haunting glow of the doomsday clock illuminating your face, its hands frozen at 90 seconds to midnight. The world around you is caught in the web of leaders who prioritize ratings over reality, their allegiance sold to the highest bidder. Media screens controlled by the hands of a deceptive few spew falsehoods, shaping a narrative far removed from the truth. The voices of dissent, those daring to challenge the facade, are swiftly silenced, their truths buried under the weight of propaganda. As the minute hand creeps ominously closer to the final hour, you witness the unraveling of civilization, a world succumbing to the whims of power-hungry demagogues. The apocalypse unfolds not with a bang, but with a silent acquiescence of a society led astray. And then, abruptly, you awaken. Your heart races as you scan the room, the doomsday clock still ominously ticking away at 90 seconds to midnight. The nightmare lingers a harrowing vision of a possible future, a stark reminder that the path we tread is paved with our choices. The world hangs in the balance, teetering on the edge of salvation or ruin. The moment of reckoning is not a distant future. It is now, and the clock waits no one. If you like this video, you'll surely love this one as well. Like and subscribe, don't forget about the bell. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in a bite.